Uh, so, hi. Uh, I hope uh, everybody feels free to uh, interrupt if there are uh, any questions or anything's unclear in the middle of the presentation as well. Normally, uh, I like to, uh, you know, present kind of reactively to an audience, so this is a little strange just staring at a, a green light emerging from my computer. Uh, but it's, it's fun to do anyway. So today I'm going to tell you about um, some of the work we've been doing in the lab on uh, multi-temperature data collection. Uh, and that work, um, some of it has recently been published uh, and represents uh, a collaboration with uh, Rob Thorne's lab at Cornell and as well my long-time uh, collaborator, Henry Van and Venom at Slack. And Daniel Keedy, a, a postdoc in my group, has been sort of spearheading that effort. And then some of the uh, work that we've been getting out of the uh, temperature data has really raised some interesting problems in how to model correlated or coupled uh, motions in proteins. And some of the experimental uh, data that's recorded during X-ray uh, experiments in the form of diffuse scattering uh, can, we hope, in the long term be used to improve the modeling of, of these multiple conformations. And so for the last several years, we've been collaborating with Mike Wall, as well as a, a whole cast of characters uh, from LBL and Los Alamos, and as well in France, uh, and Andrew Van Benskoten, a former uh, graduate student in my lab, who's now a data scientist at Oracle, uh, has, sort of, has led that effort. So that I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. So obviously, um, you know, this, this audience really cares about the use of X-ray uh, free electron lasers in structural biology. And I think one of the obvious and, and most powerful opportunities is really to introduce this, the time dimension uh, more into, into crystallography. So it's really all about time. I think we're transitioning from really static views of structural biology to much more dynamic views of, of how uh, proteins move as they undergo uh, their functions. One of the major challenges, though, is, um, is that not all systems are, are so conveniently wired as a uh, photoactive yellow protein or, uh, or carboxymyoglobin, where there's an easy and accessible um, optical trigger to, uh, to really begin our time-resolved uh, investigations. And so we've been thinking a lot um, in our XFEL studies about using temperature as a global perturbation uh, to help us uh, initiate uh, confirmation, conformational sampling in the protein and, and then learn something new about the biological mechanism. And, and what I'm going to talk about today is really our, our uh, transition point between that hopefully dynamic future where we really do uh, use the time dimension and uh, our current sort of static techniques where we're, we're trying to infer uh, aspects of the energy landscape from the time and space average of the extra crystallography experiment. So my group is interested in how allosteric perturbations are communicated within proteins to alter uh, protein function. And so we think about um, how the conformational equilibrium between this yellow conformation, which might have one activity, and the blue conformation, which might have another activity, maybe higher activity, uh, can be altered by a perturbation, say a mutation represented here by this X, and how that might shift this equilibrium. And one of the ways uh, that we like to look at how these uh, conformational equilibria have changed is through crystallography. And so proteins, uh, although we're, we're used to the result of a conventional X-ray experiment being a single set of, uh, of coordinates that we deposit in the PDB, proteins often, often populate multiple conformations in the crystal. So the lattice is not homogeneously yellow, as shown here, but really represents uh, a whole series of, of conformational conformations um, that, that, that can be quite distinct. So for example, uh, you know, many enzymes are active in the crystal, uh, in the crystal lattice. 
And from the x-ray experiment, at least in conventional experiments, we don't really have any information about whether that conformational heterogeneity is static. That is to say whether the blue proteins are blue for eternity uh, or whether it's dynamic, whether it ex we see exchange between the blue and yellow conformations over the course of the x-ray experiment. I think it's most, like, most probable that, that most of the conformational heterogeneity that we see uh, is dynamic, and obviously that has to be the case if we're eventually going to do time-resolved experiments on, on these types of systems. But formally, we, we can't tell that from the X-ray experiment. So my group um, has really been interested in using temperature to shift the relative populations of conformations in the crystal. And so we think of temperature as a global perturbation um, as opposed to a local perturbation like I showed you uh, at the beginning with the mutation example. And that global perturbation can change the relative population of these conformations. So we, we you know, might see an increase in the, uh, in the population of the blue conformation. And in a lot of cases, just changing the relative populations uh, is interesting, but one of the most interesting properties is, is a lot of the time we see conformations at higher temperatures that we couldn't previously see at lower temperatures, either because they were too sparsely uh, populated um, or, or because they were too sparsely populated uh, at, at, at cooler temperatures. And, and this has really uh, led the lab to uh, work around two sort of fundamental hypotheses uh, that we bring to a lot of our uh, investigations on, on more mechanistic problems, uh, biochemical problems. The first is that shifting temperatures really can expose relevant protein conformations that are near, near the ground state. So just by giving that general kick uh, to the, the protein, we can, we can see uh, different conformations than if we didn't change the temperature. And the, the second hypothesis is that these additional conformations that we're exposing by shifting the temperature are used by the protein in its physiological uh, mechanisms. And, and we think that this is really important because conformational dynamics is sort of one of the impossible uh, things to really get a structural basis on. We have really uh, powerful solution-based uh, tools for, um, for examining uh, or determining whether there are conformational dynamics occurring. Um, but we, uh, it's very difficult to simultaneously uh, figure out whether there's conformational heterogeneity and reveal what the structures of uh, the protein is, is sampling. We think that, the, that this uh, you know, problem of of defining a structural basis for conformational dynamics really lies at the core of three critical problems in biology. Um, you know, as, as, as molecular biologists, we often want to design macromolecules with new, often unnatural functions in the context of protein design and protein engineering and synthetic biology, um, but we're not very efficient at making uh, new, new molecules with, with new functions currently. We want to be able to understand how mutations alter protein function in disease, both in terms of uh, disease, human disease, where, where naturally uh, occurring mutations in the population give rise to uh, genetic uh, diseases, um, but also in the cases of, of drug resistance, uh, in cancer and in in antibacterials, and often the mutations that, that are uh, sampled in, in these disease processes uh, are just at the active site, and they're very simple to explain. Um, but also, uh, quite commonly, we find these mutations are sort of scattered throughout the protein with no obvious role in the chemical function of the protein in terms of its catalytic mechanism, or in perturbing the global stability such that we think the, the protein would no longer fold. So why are these mutations uh, altering protein function of disease? That's something I think we, we want to know um, 
in, as, as molecular biologists. And then finally, we'd like to be able to discover small molecule uh, modulators of, of protein function. And, and again, there, we often would like to just go after the active site. Um, but there, there are cases where, where that's, you know, uh, chemically impossible, or we can't get enough binding energy, or, or the molecules that, that would bind to the active site would have unfavorable PK or PD. And so we need to be able to go after different sites on the protein. Maybe these are transient sites that are only uh, sampled when the protein leaves sort of its ground state confirmation. And so in, in all of these problems, in, in finding new pockets, in explaining the action of mutations that are distant from critical sites for chemistry, and in designing proteins with new functions, we really need to be able to understand how the protein samples different structures and get a structural basis of what the conformational dynamics uh, the protein is undergoing uh, to, to improve our, our understanding. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that really, uh, sort of encapsulates a lot of, of what my lab goes after. We're, we're interested in, in these class of problems, and we're, we're interested in using the approach of shifting temperature to expose additional confirmations uh, that, that will give us new insights into these, uh, these class of problems. And so, you know, later in the talk, I'll highlight a few recent examples of, of how we've done that, but right now I'm just going to tell you sort of about the, the first the first part, how we how we came to understand about shifting temperatures e exposing uh, different conformations. So conventional X-ray experiments, not X-ray for electron laser experiments, but conventional uh, X-ray experiments at synchrotrons or, or at home sources are, are, are performed at cryogenic temperatures. So the first thing we do as crystallographers is, you know, pick up our, our crystal and dunk it into uh, liquid nitrogen. And there are really good reasons to do this. One, it makes uh, shipping the, the crystal much easier. Uh, two, it protects against radiation damage. Um, but uh, there are also some, some downsides to this, as we'll see. So, you know, early on, we, we spent a lot of time figuring out how best to collect data at, at ambient temperatures. And so first we uh, would use this uh, free mounting device at, uh, at beamline 1231, which is shown here. And this is basically a, a, a humidified goniometer head. And that allowed us to mount crystals and can very precisely control the humidity and temperature that the crystal was experiencing uh, during data collection. Now we commonly use these Mitogen MicroRT sleeves um, to control the humidity and keep the crystal sort of happy during data collection and, and the cryostat um, at beam lines to control the temperature. We also have to pay special attention to the way we collect the data to minimize uh, radiation damage effects at conventional sources. Although now uh, with the potential to outrun radiation damage through more diffract and destroy type uh, experiments at XFELs, um, we can sort of get all the benefits of room temperature data collection without uh, really any of the downsides. So what are those, those benefits of, of collecting the data at room temperature? Because certainly Cryocooling, the, the radiation damage uh, aspect, enables you to determine structures or co collect complete data sets uh, where previously you would not be able to at ambient temperature. So what's really going on? So the first thing that the, the literature has really pointed out is that cryocooling contracts the lattice and the protein. So on the... Uh, on the well, the left side of the screen, if you're facing it, uh, I'm showing some data from a paper from Doug Jewers and Brian Matthews from JMB. And in this case, they, uh, they had a very special crystal that, that would uh, reversibly uh, cryocool. Um, so they would collect, a, they could get a few frames at room temperature, that's the RT, then cool the crystal down to 100 Kelvin and collect an LT data set, then heat it back up and collect an RT data set. And one thing that they notice is that they, 
every time they crowd cool, the unit cell would shrink, although you can see there's a little bit of variability in exactly how much it would shrink. And as well, the mosaicity would increase. And you can think of that as basically all the unit cells uh, are not experiencing or do not have exactly the same uh, bond or cell lengths or, or cell angles as in the RT experiment. Um, and some classic work by Hans Fraunfelder and colleagues showed this uh, is not really just a unit cell effect, that the protein itself is also contracting uh, as you cryocool down to 100 Kelvin. So this is really giving us an idea that cryocooling is leading to some uh, very interesting global effects on the, on the protein. Um, similar groups uh, or some of the, from the same papers have also shown that there are some very idiosyncratic local conformational changes, changes in structure and as well in conformational heterogeneity that occur upon cryocooling. So on the uh, left, again, I'm showing data from that Jewers and Matthews paper. You can see that um, the room temperature structure in red and the cryocool structure in blue, we actually see some displacement of some side chain and backbone atoms as well as changes in solvation. Um, and this idea really has been around for a while. There's, uh, you know, one of my favorite classic papers from Hans Fraunfelder and Greg Petsko looks at the evolution of B factors as a proxy for conformational heterogeneity and how that changes as a function of temperature. And they really found this sort of classic um, hockey stick-like relationship around 200 Kelvin where, where the B factors sort of stop evolving in a temperature dependent way. And so, you know, the, the big conclusion from all of this is that crowd cooling sort of sh slowly shrinks the proteins and remodels the side chains and improve, can improve the packing in the crystal lattice. But the, the downside is that it's going to remove evidence of these internal motions, um, internal uh, conformational heterogeneity for many proteins. And so here I'm showing just a very dramatic uh, shrinking of a, of a crystal lattice as it's exposed to uh, the cryogen. So one of the other uh, downsides of, of cryocooling is that this process uh, does not seem to be very reproducible. It, it can uh, lead to very idiosyncratic effects on protein uh, conformational heterogeneity. We actually were, had a really uh, unique handle at, uh, looking at this uh, when I was talking uh, at, a, at a symposium in uh, discussing a data set that we had collected uh, of dihydrofolate reductase in 2013. Um, and Greg Petsko, uh, who I mentioned previously, came up to me and said, you know, I think we collected pretty much the exact same data in 2005, a match room temperature cryo pair of the exact same protein in the exact same catalytic state. And he said, but we never published it. And so what we did was we got together and Daniel Keaty really spearheaded this work and compared the electron density maps for the data sets that we had collected in 2013 and the data sets that Greg's lab had collected in 2005. And what I'm showing here are isomorphous difference maps between um, the 2013 and 2005 experiments, and as well between room temperature and cryo. And so what you can see um, at the top is that the, the, the isomorphous difference maps for the cryogenic experiments uh, indicate that there are lots of subtle uh, conformational changes, changes in solvation, repositioning of the protein that occur upon cryocooling. Um, these changes are bigger than the changes uh, that are experienced by any individual crab cooling experiment. But the really striking result for us was that the room temperature difference maps were essentially flat. There were no, um, there were very few uh, differences between the room temperature data sets collected uh, on basically a decade apart. And so the, the room temperature data were really more consistent than the, the cryocooled data, and consistent in an important property in that they were showing the same conformations, but also 
uh, not just one structure, but, but multiple structures. And so the, the challenge really for figuring out what's going on at ambient temperatures is to deconvolute all of these confirmations from an electron density map that is an average in time and space. So although we know the protein is exchanging between different conformations, for example, the blue and yellow conformations here, the signature of that exchange is deposited in the real space electron density map as an ensemble average. And so it's uh, overlapped uh, in space. And it's quite difficult to tell, based on just staring at it by eye, which electron density signals we can truly trust. And so as a graduate student, I was involved in developing an approach called Ringer that allows us to assay the electron density uh, to tell us which signals we can, we can really trust. And so the way Ringer works is we look around the dihedral, each dihedral angle in a three-dimensional uh, or, or a 360 degree view. We're going to record the electron density uh, as we move around this ring. And uh, what we find is that obviously the side chains are built into the high density regions. That's that single peak there. And although only 5% of residues are modeled in multiple conformations in the PDB, what we find is if we look below one sigma, there are often additional peaks that could correspond to additional confirmations that aren't currently modeled. And one very stringent test of whether these peaks uh, represent something real is to look at their distribution in dihedral space. So over 600 structures, we looked at all these uh, peaks. And what I'm showing you here on the right is a histogram of where those peaks are distributed in dihedral space. And you can see they're sharply uh, uh, peaked at 60, 180, and minus 60 degrees, suggesting that they represent rotomers of this uh, staggered uh, low energy positions of protein side chains. They're non-randomly distributed, um, which suggests that actually at these lower levels of electron density, there are additional signals that we're not uh, currently modeling. Additionally, most of these peaks, um, we could then find an, a, evidence for uh, additional electron density for further out along the side chains, and those uh, peaks were also enriched at rhodomeric uh, positions. And so really what this did was give us confidence in the electron density signals at very low levels. And in fact, we think there's really a, a sweet spot of, of electron density in most maps that's currently not being well modeled uh, by, our, by our tools. Um, and and We've now been devoting quite a lot of effort towards automatically uh, modeling those uh, very weak signals. And so in, in collaboration with Henry Van den Benham over the past few years, we've de been developing a multi modeling tool called QFIT. Q, of course, for the uh, crystallographic uh, variable for occupancy. So this is essentially occupancy fit. Um, and what this does is uh, it automates the multi conformer modeling process, including both uh, side chain and backbone flexibility. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, what we uh, do is we find uh, in electron density maps uh, additional conformations that, that are uh, well fit to the map uh, by sampling a large, a large uh, conformational space, and then selecting only those conformations that help explain the data better. And I'd point out that sort of our latest version of this uh, software has recently been published uh, in the past month in PLOS Bio. We've used this um, approach to look at how sidechain conformations are remodeled by crowd cooling. So the, the major effect of crowd cooling is not to, you know, cause gross distortions to the uh, backbone, but rather to change the, uh, the relative distributions of, of most sidechain conformations. Uh, and we found that more than 35% of sidechain conformations are actually remodeled by the crowd cooling process, including about 30% of all, all buried residues. 
Um, in addition, the uh, simply moving between cryo cooling and room temperature has has allowed us to uh, explain a, a bunch of sort of biochemical mysteries. This is the first one that we solved, where we were really trying to figure out what was giving rise to an NMR relaxation signal that that it said that this this enzyme was moving between. Uh, multiple confirmations. I mean, what we discovered surprisingly was that it was a series of uh, of side chain rearrangements that extended all the way from the core of the protein out to the active site. We were then able to design a specific mutations to demonstrate that these dynamics of exchanging between the major and minor state were actually rate limiting uh, for function. And so, you know, the the theme of this is really that that we get a biased subset of the ensemble at 100 Kelvin. And I think we can do a better job by looking at, at ambient uh, temperature electron density maps and then modeling them using these multi conferer models. Uh, importantly, you know, for, for this audience, these, the types of conformational differences that I've uh, shown you today uh, are not strictly confined to synchrotron room temperature data sets. But in fact, there are important differences that are emerging between crowd cooled structures that have been determined as synchrotrons and room temperature structures that have been determined at uh, X files. And so here I'm just showing some examples um, from Vadim Cherizov's group uh, published in Science two years ago, where we can see changes in hydrogen bonding patterns. The, uh, register of uh, alpha helix and, and other uh, subtle conformational changes for a GPCR uh, with the crowd cooled structure from synchrotron data in blue and the room temperature structure uh, in can I And can so, I, can I interrupt? Can you hear me? John. Hey. Um, how do you show in that work that the crystallization conditions were identical? Sorry? How did Liu and Cherezov establish that the crystallization conditions were identical? How did they determine that the crystallization conditions were identical? Um, I, I just think that they were, you know, it's the same LCP and same, um, same crystallization conditions, but, I, you know, it's not from the exact same you know, well, uh, their same stock of crystals. I would point out that, you know, even their synchrotron data set is somewhat of a, a serial uh, crystallography approach in that uh, it did require the merging of, of multiple uh, crystals harvested, um, well, not harvested, frozen uh, in the LCP mixture. But so, this must be a general problem when you're looking for very small conformational changes, isn't it? You've got You've got to know that the chemistry is identical in forming them. Yes, certainly. I mean, any temperature is an important global perturbation, but so <laughs> is the mother liquor, the pH, uh, you know, all of, all of those aspects. And in fact, you know, what's driving a lot of the uh, conformational differences for a lot of these things with the temperature changes is, is really wrapped up in the fact that the buffering of the uh, of the uh, buffers in the mother liquor is probably breaking down or, or changing uh, as you as you cool. For example, tris uh, tris buffer, which is used quite commonly, uh, you know, will shift the pH quite dramatically as you as you cool cool it down. Hey James, this is Rob from ASU. Does the vacuum at the X bell have any effect on on the uh, the global structure? Well, in, in this case, you know, it's, it's hard to tell what is giving rise to the conformational differences, right? We have the room temperature or the, I guess, extruded from ambient temperature into vacuum uh, shown in, in pink, and then we have the crowd cooled at synchrotron. Uh, in blue, so we don't really know, uh, you know, there, are, as, as was pointed out, there are sort of multiple factors at play here. I, I'm inclined to think that the major difference is simply the, uh, the effective temperature that, that the protein is feeling, um, and certainly the vacuum 
uh, maybe, you know, making it somewhat different than at, than at room temperature. Uh, but uh, there, there are definitely multiple factors at play. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. I'm going to continue. Thank you for the back and forth, though. All right, so um, so we're we're interested in in uh, in these sort of problems of, of conformational heterogeneity and our failure currently to uh, to rationalize the action of, of mutations or discover new binding sites, and so really one of the, the key questions we've been asking over the past few years is, can temperature perturbation expose the protein conformations that we, uh, that we really care about in these, uh, in these biochemically interesting systems? And so uh, I'm just going to highlight very briefly on a, on a few slides some examples of, of how we've done that, where there have been really new insights uh, available to us by collecting the data at ambient temperatures and using multi confer modeling that would not be available using either crowd-cooled data or if even if we collected the room temperature data and really just modeled a, a single structure into the electron density. So it's really the, the combination of the changes in data collection uh, in the experimental aspect and the computational aspect of the uh, of how we model the conformational heterogeneity. So, in, for example, when we in protein design, we want to be able to uh, create proteins with new unnatural functions. And it, one of the uh, projects that we've been involved in in that that respect has been a collaboration with Jacob Korn, who was at Genentech at the time, where they were designing redesigning variants of the protein ubiquitin to inhibit. A specific deubiquitinase, in this case USP7, to de-risk it as a drug target. And their goal was essentially to, to introduce mutations into the core of ubiquitin that would change the structure of a critical loop from the uh, conformation that I'm showing uh, in green to the conformation that I'm showing in blue. And so they does use computational protein design to choose a subset of residues. And what they got out, or what we got out when we determined the room temperature x-ray structure to very high resolution, was that that loop, rather than being uh, perturbed into that specific conformation that they wanted, actually took on multiple conformations. And we see this theme over and over again, where currently protein design is creating proteins that are a little bit too dynamic, but it is getting it out of its, its wild type local energy minimum. And then what happened, as in many uh, protein design projects, is Jacob and his team performed some directed evolution experiments. And then when we got that protein, we found that the dynamics of, of that loop were significantly reduced. So it went from being uh, exhibiting multiple conformations along that loop to just a single conformation. And here I'm just showing some electron density for one of the residues in the center of that loop um, where you can see the design mutant. That phenylalanine is taking out multiple conformations. There's far too much electron density to be explained by uh, or spread of electron density to be explained by a single phenylalanine residue. Whereas in the affinity enhanced mutant after direct evolution, we see it's really calmed down to a, a single conformation. So we're, we're interested in Justin Beal in my lab who performed uh, these, these experiments, uh, is interested in how the dynamics of designed and artificially evolved proteins differ from natural proteins and how this general theme of design proteins becoming too dynamic and then through undirected, direct, undirected evolution, <laughs> uh, through random selection, laboratory selection, we then seem to anneal them into a single conformation could be improved with knowledge of, of exactly how the dynamics of the design mutants uh, has increased. Second, we want to really understand um, how mutations alter uh, protein function in disease. Um, and so I mentioned that, you know, this is trivial in cases where active site chemistry 
has been changed. But there are often a lot of cases where mutations have occurred outside of the residues that directly participate in the catalytic mechanism. And it's often difficult to explain the action of those mutations without uh, invoking conformational dynamics. So in, in this project, we were looking at the antibiotic resistance protein TEM1, and it becomes uh, resistant to, to antibiotics through one of, of two initial mutations, either R164S or G238S. And depending on which mutation you choose first, you then uh, evolve a whole set, uh, or the bacteria then evolve a whole set of additional mutations that help uh, tune its activity. But one of the things that's, that's very interesting is that although these are the two largest single effect mutations, when you combine them together, uh, the protein is essentially non-functional. And so we wanted to figure that out with, with Danny Tofik. What we found is that each of the individual mutations increases the dynamics, the conformational dynamics of a different key catalytic loop, either the omega loop in the case of R164S or the 238 loop in the case of G238S. And that we were able to then make the protein of the double mutant, which is never really observed in nature, and figure out why it's, uh, it's essentially non-functional. And that's that by breaking the conformational dynamics or increasing the conformational dynamics in both of these loops, you introduce the possibility that new non-native interactions can form and stabilize the protein in a non-catalytic conformation. And so this actually suggests some interesting ideas where you could discover combination therapies that really have drastically different and, and in fact competing uh, paths to resistance. Uh, and create uh, combination therapies that, that might have very beneficial properties. So finally, we'd, we'd like to be able to discover small molecules that, that can modulate uh, protein function. And again, here, the use of room temperature data collection and multi-confer modeling has really been key uh, to, to our work. So in collaboration with, with Brian Schoiket over the past few years, we first showed that in one of their model um, systems for doing in silico uh, drug discovery, um, that, that the data collection temperature would actually modulate the conformational heterogeneity of the key loop that essentially makes all the interactions. Uh, with, with the small molecules that they discover. And, and in fact, the, the confirmation that is best for small molecule binding is only populated at ambient, at room temperature and not at crowd cool temperatures. And over the course of this study, we also found that there were several small molecule binding sites scattered throughout the protein that were temperature dependent. So that is to say, uh, at this cryptic site here, we could soak a small molecule into the protein and see it bind, and then and collect the collect a full data set, and then immediately crowd cool that that crystal, and that small molecule would be ejected and replaced with just a few ordered water molecules. And so this actually is a, a, a really striking result for us. Does somebody? Yeah, is the yellow the room temperature and the stick model the frozen? On on the uh, on the loop, those are actually all different different conformations modeled into a single electron density map. So those are all all there at the same time in the room temperature data. The A, B, and C. What did the frozen C. one look like? What did the frozen one look like? The frozen one essentially looks just only like the uh, purple. So it's, you're missing a lot of the features of the side chains of the yellow and, and the path is different as well. So that's, that's published uh, work, so you could pull up that, that paper later. Um, and so, you know, from, from these studies we found changes in the types of small molecules that we would discover by these in silico 
docking experiments, as well as the types of sites that we could take advantage of in either uh, directed uh, small molecule discovery efforts or, or totally undirected ones in, in for example, fragment, fragment soaking experiments. Uh, finally, you know, the, one of the key uh, aspects for, uh, for really small molecule optimization is in considering not only the conformational heterogeneity of the protein in terms of its match to the ligand, but also the surrounding uh, the solvent. And in the flu channel, uh, the flu ion channel, M2, uh, we've seen a dramatic change in the water electron density as we shift uh, temperature. So what I'm showing here is our electron density maps in a volumetric representation, where I'm showing data at high pH, uh, in collected high pH in green and at low pH in magenta. What this does is create sort of this gray haze where they overlap completely. And you can see it at cryogenic temperatures, um, we see a, a lot of, of overlap. Um, and at room temperature, we see much less. And we see some common features, such as the, at the top of the channel, uh, a sort of increased water density at high pH. At low pH, we see some differences uh, at the bottom of the channel. I would point out that the drugs bind sort of right in the, in the middle of this channel. Um, and so we were, we were quite interested in what causes uh, this change in water density in the channel. Uh, is pH uh, seems to be having a smaller effect than, than temperature in a lot of ways. And uh, in this case, pH is intimately linked to the protein function as well as uh, its drug binding mechanism. The major caveat from our room temperature uh, data has been, of course, the radiation damage effects. And I'm happy to say that Rahel and Jessica just collected uh, beautiful uh, data sets at SACLA uh, last week that at both uh, high pH and low pH uh, at, uh, at ambient temperature using their LCP setup there. And so we, we should get a, a much better idea of what the uh, solvent changes are uh, within, within this channel in the coming days uh, from, from the XFEL experiment. So the, the overall you know, theme that I've been emphasizing here is that these low occupancy features uh, present at room temperature are, are really dynamically accessed conformations that, that we can then analyze to provide new mechanistic insights uh, into the, the protein. And so, you know, that, that the challenge is uh, not just in the data collection being different, but also in the modeling. And so it's relatively easy to model these alternative conformations when they're quite uh, segregated in space, as I'm showing here with these two alternative conformations of this loop. Um, but but it, it becomes much more complicated when they overlap more in space. And so we're, we've become interested in, in using not just the extremes of temperature, but also temperature series to watch how these populations shift uh, between the relative, uh, relative conformations. Uh, in the crystal and ask whether this happens collectively and what that can uh, tell us about the energy landscape of the of the protein so in, in the next uh, you know few minutes I'm going to tell you about is some work where we haven't just collected at cryogenic and room temperature but we've actually collected a, a whole a whole um, series of, of temperatures and and in this um, well, since we're running a little long, I think I'll, I'll skip some of the, uh, the glass transition stuff. Um, what we found in, in the protein cyclophilin A is that the conformational heterogeneity is very, very sensitive uh, to temperature changes. So in collaboration with Rob Thorne and Matt Workington, we collected a, a series of data sets over a wide uh, temperature range spanning 100 Kelvin to 310 Kelvin. And what you can see, if you focus in on, on the difference density features here 
in the FOFC map is you can see that this phenylalanine is sort of building up the population of its alternative conformations as we cross over uh, 200 Kelvin. And there are other corresponding changes as well. If we go and explicitly model that uh, using QFIN and other approaches, we can see now actually there are multiple conformations for all of these residues that, that are primarily populated above, above 200 Kelvin. So what I'm going to show you now is, is a movie where the, uh, the, of, of the temperature uh, progression of cyclophilin A. Uh, and what you can see is that the electron density really builds up for these alternative conformations above, uh, above 200 Kelvin. So anytime the, uh, the protein model changes color, that is a real electron density map. And anytime in between there, it's our interpolation of the, uh, of the structure factors between uh, these different temperatures to, to give us an idea of how, how the temperature progression uh, might proceed. And so um, to skip over sort of a, a, a whole series of, of work, one of the things that, that this has uh, told us is that actually different regions of the protein are trapped, uh, have their disorder really arrested at different effective temperatures. And this is quite surprising to us we, we, because previously we've been looking only at 100 Kelvin and room temperature data. By filling in this whole uh, sort of uh, series of temperatures, it, it really caused us to question or really told us uh, why, why it's been so hard to extrapolate from the cryocooled data to what the room temperature ensemble uh, should look like. And that's because the, the, really the energy landscape of proteins is, is quite complex. And so we, we lose the ability to uh, resolve different uh, populations of alternative conformations as they fall below about 10% occupancy. And that, sh that shift uh, to basically being unobservable happens at, at different temperatures at, at different places throughout the protein. So it's, it's very difficult once we're, once everything has pretty much arrested at 100 Kelvin to then figure out how to cleanly extrapolate back to the ambient temperature ensemble. Um, and, and this really informed some of our mechanistic studies of, of psychophilin A. Before this work, we really um, we really thought there's a that there was a global shift of conformations of these protein side chains between uh, sort of an in conformation and out conformation that occurred on the millisecond time scale, which we knew from NMR dynamics. And now what we we think is that actually there's there is still something that's essentially uh, determining the NMR uh, exchange rate, the observable NMR exchange rate on the millisecond time scale. Um, but, and, and we think that that's the transition of that key phenylalanine residue in the middle of this dynamic network. But there are also many more complicated jumps uh, between different sidechain conformations that we think are occurring on much faster time scales. And so this type of uh, mechanism is essentially called a, a population shuffle, where, uh, where the, the confirmation of one residue, for example, phi-113, is biasing the relative populations of the surrounding residues, which are then exchanging on much faster uh, timescales. And this leads to all sorts of uh, interesting uh, potential NMR and X-ray experiments for us to do to test this mechanism. One of the uh, X-ray experiments we'd like to do uh, is to take advantage of, of the XFEL to, to uh, deliver a, a temperature jump uh, to the protein and watch the relative populations of all of these conformations change. We already had a hint that this was uh, probably going on uh, from analysis of just the uh, just the room temperature X-ray ensemble, in that the alternative conformations, um, when, when we got 
really into the detailed modeling of it, did not cleanly segregate into an A conformation and a B conformation. If we were to propagate sort of all the clashes between uh, different conformations, it actually uh, suggested that there was something uh, much more complicated uh, going on. And so we, we wrote some software to, to analyze that and called it contact that basically pulls out networks of residues that have this potential to influence the relative populations of surrounding alternative conformations. And this brings me to the, the final point of the talk, which is uh, Mark Wilson, uh, who's at Nebraska, wrote a, a really nice uh, news and views uh, about that paper and, uh, and sort of discussing how these kinds of software are really valuable for figuring out which uh, motions are correlated, but that there is the potential to analyze the X-ray diffraction, highlighting that there is the potential for the X-ray experiment to directly reveal these types of correlations. And so, um, you know, here he writes a possible solution to this problem is the use of X-ray diffuse scattering data, which contain information about all correlated motions in the crystal. And this is something that we were already thinking about um, and it, it, it was nice to, to sort of read an outside, outsider's perspective that, that he was uh, thinking along the same lines we are, uh, or we were at the time. And so diffuse scattering is the, all the, the X-ray scattering that is left on the detector outside of the uh, Bragg peaks. And the real utility of it from a modeling point of view is that it can distinguish between different models of conformational heterogeneity that result in the same mean electron density distribution within the crystal. And so to illustrate that, from, if we imagine uh, this protein here exchanging between different conformations, from the Bragg scattering, we have no idea which of these conformations uh, move uh, together. We just have a view of what the average, uh, the ensemble average electron density distribution is. But uh, from the diffuse scattering, we can distinguish between, potentially distinguish between these possibilities. So here I'm showing sort of in the rainbow colored, we move from red to blue up along the top and red to blue along the bottom. Well, that is different than moving from red to blue along the top and blue to red along the bottom. Even though those will result in the same ensemble averaged electron density distribution, they're actually different, uh, different models of conformational heterogeneity. One is sort of a Pac-Man model where the things come together like a Pac-Man. The other is more of a windshield, windshield wipers model uh, where they sort of alternate between extrema together. And so we were interested in whether we could develop software to extract these features and, and then use it to rule out, uh, initially to rule out different models of conformational heterogeneity. And so there, because diffuse scattering uh, and, and, and the molecular motion uh, are related uh, as, uh, as uh, as Bragg scattering is to electron density through a real to reciprocal space uh, uh, relationship, uh, I'd like to just remind everybody that these that in diffuse scattering, small features actually represent correlations between unit cells. And so here I'm showing some diffraction data from Welbury et al., where you get these interesting halos. You can see, hopefully, in the bottom uh, part of the screen here, blown up an example, that are uh, indicative of correlated displacements uh, between different, of, of different unit cells. Whereas larger features actually uh, result from correlated motions or correlated uh, changes in electron density distributions that occur within unit cells. And this, uh, this has a, an interesting but sparse history extending back um, even earlier, but, but most notably uh, from this paper in Nature in 1988 from, from Donald Casper and colleagues, where they see the total scattering here, 
they try to isolate the Bragg scattering alone and then subtract it to result in the diffuse scattering here. Um, that scattering is dominated by mostly isotropic contributions that are related to resolution, but there are also uh, anisotropic contributions that relate to the protein and the protein solvent interface. So Andrew Bambenskoten and uh, in my lab and Mike Wall, our collaborator at Los Alamos, have, um, have been interested in testing different models of correlated motion uh, and comparing them to diffuse scattering. Uh, this can be done uh, either with an explicit uh, model of the covariance of all atoms in the unit cell or using this trick called Guinea's equation uh, where it matters sort of whether how you uh, how you look at the structure factors of individual conformations, uh, basically treating these individual conformations as different unit cells. And so we've written some software within Phoenix to automate this procedure. Um, we've also, in P1, it's quite straightforward to uh, expand the unit cell to allow for a finer sampling of reciprocal space uh, to map the diffuse scattering relationship. And this allows us then to take any given ensemble and compare the predicted diffuse scattering to the experimentally observed diffuse scattering. We've done that in two primary ways. First, we've used long molecular dynamic simulations of proteins in crystals to provide to test mechanisms of diffuse scattering. And this agreement um, is very, very nice in terms of the isotropic diffuse scattering, um, but still needs some improvement in terms of the anisotropic diffuse scattering, which are really the features that we, we care about. This is how the protein is moving and how the solvent is moving relative to protein. And this also suggests an opportunity for molecular dynamics where uh, we might actually motivate improvements in sampling and scoring as well. Uh, you'll note that the protein here uh, is staph nuclease, and that's really because staph nuclease uh, is the only uh, protein where there's currently a three-dimensional map of the diffuse scattering. And so this dates back to Mike Wall's thesis work with Saul Gruner in 1997. Uh, Andrew and Mike have been working quite hard uh, to establish a few other models of diffuse scattering. I'm really happy to say we have a couple other maps that have uh, that seem to have very high quality uh, diffuse scattering and that we're using to uh, test different models of correlated motion. The, the quick punchline is that one of the most common methods that we use to model uh, displacement in, in PDB structures TLS models, translation libration screw models of grouped anisotropic uh, B factors are quite poor at explaining the diffuse uh, intensities, probably because these delineate very sharp boundaries uh, between different rigid body segments of the protein. Um, Liquid-like motions, which is a model that, that Casper has used in the past and, and Mike Wall has used in the past, um, which essentially uh, relates uh, says that motions will be correlated over a certain length scale, uh, give a, a much better uh, agreement with the experimental data. So we think um, <clears throat> that, that actually this can help drive new models of, of grouped uh, B-factor refinement to resemble something much more like the liquid-like motions model. Okay, and so with that, I sort of gave a very broad overview of of how conformational dynamics are, are at the core of, of critical problems in, in biology and how we're using temperature perturbations to expose the same coupled protein conformations that can really be used in design, in understanding disease mutations, and in discovering small molecule drugs. And I, I underlined the, or highlight the coupled nature here because I think it's a really exciting time uh, for total scattering and diffuse scattering um, and new light sources to really get an idea of not just what are the electron density distributions of, of proteins, but how do those, uh, those different conformations vary uh, together in a coupled fashion. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank the members of my lab. I'm highlighting here Rahel and Mike, who are members 
uh, a BioExpo members. Daniel Keedy, who uh, did a, led the analysis of all the multi-temperature work. Andrew, uh, who, who led the diffuse scattering work and uh, funding sources. And of course, uh, most notably for, for uh, this talk, the uh, BioExpo funding that we received. I'm happy to take a few questions. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions?